please welcome one of the great archaeologists of our era, Dr. Michael Coe. Thank you, Caroline. This evening I'm going to supposedly tell you about new light on the ancient Maya. It would take about ten hours to do this. I have one hour. So I'm going to concentrate on new things that interest me that I think you would like to know about. And I'm also going to talk about the lack of new light, in other words, on areas of Maya studies that really we don't know anything about and that we'd like to know more about. Areas that are controversial, too, in which I and my friends have one interpretation and my enemies have another. But I'll see how they can be reconciled. So that's what's on the agenda for tonight. It's an incredibly complicated subject. Often I'm asked by, called up by people in TV characters and whatnot who say, we want to do a thing in the BBC or something on the Maya. Tell us all you know about the Maya. It can't be done. It's too complex. So I'm just going to give it a once over lightly and go through from beginning to end the things that are going on in the Maya area now that I know about that are different or that we need to have more work and that have thrown new light on these people. The Maya area, you all know exactly where it is. It's a very compact area, compact linguistically and compact culturally. There are differences in the Maya area when you move, let's say, from one area to the next, but they are small compared to the differences with the rest of the civilized people of Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is a cultural area which includes the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Zapotecs, the Huastecs, etc. These are people who all had a pretty advanced civilization compared to the rest of the people in North America, north of the Isthmus of Panama. The area has a certain definite restricted quality as far as ecological possibilities go here, and that's still being worked on. I took this picture in the Peyten, the northern part of Guatemala, the Guatemalan lowlands, in an area in which the forest has not been cut down, which is not the case for a lot of the lowland Maya area today. That's not what it looked like at all when the ancient Maya civilization was going. In fact, that forest probably didn't exist. Much of it was cut down by the Maya with consequences that I'm going to talk about later. But there is a very strongly marked rainy season. You can see this great thunderstorm in northern Guatemala. This is right on the Mexican border. Uh, and a very uh, equally strongly marked dry season. Uh, so that's the regime that controls all of agriculture in this part of the world. What's really new in uh, Maya archaeology uh, today is the study of Maya origins. And we know much more about this than we ever would have known, uh, let's say, 25 or 40 or 75 uh, years ago. In fact, 75 years ago or 100 years ago, nothing was known about uh, Maya origins. Uh, we had an idea of how old the Maya civilization was, but that was uh, about all. Uh, because of the uh, correlation between the Maya calendar and the Christian calendar, which uh, was a triumph of 19th century uh, scholarship, uh, we have known how to date uh, classic Maya ruins. But how, who, where, where these people originated and how many of the traits that are in the classic Maya came about, we knew nothing about, and we're getting to know a lot now. I think that most of us who work on this subject accept, not all, but most of us accept the idea that Maya civilization really has its underpinnings in the Olmec civilization of southeastern Mexico, especially along the... Uh, the Gulf Coast uh, uh, plain here on the northern side of the Isthmus of, of Tehuantepec. This is a civilization that begins 
probably even earlier than 1200 BC that I put here, but in terms of true years, probably as old as 1500 BC, when you correct the radiocarbon dates for the true ages. By 400 BC, it's over. And it's two great sites, although there are many in this region uh, here. The two great sites are the oldest, which is San Lorenzo, and then La Venta. And San Lorenzo was where urban life begins uh, for the Maya, where civilized life as we know it begins with the first pyramids, the first big constructions, the first monumental carving, the first real iconography of the gods and so forth. And, of course, it's famous for these uh, portraits of their kings, these gigantic uh, basalt uh, uh, heads, of which over a dozen are known for San Lorenzo and a smaller number for La Venta and uh, other sites. At first, San Lorenzo is the great site. Um, it has no equals anywhere else in Mesoamerica, and then later, La Venta. Curiously enough, in the Maya area proper to the east, uh, these people, while uh, the Olmec were carving enormous stone monuments, the, uh, the Maya themselves really didn't amount to much, uh, except when you get into about 600 B.C. in the Maya lowlands here of northern Guatemala and the southern part of the Yucatan Peninsula, where we're getting the first evidences for really large-scale construction uh, using limestone. But this is work in progress right now, and the future is going to hold all sorts of uh, interesting possibilities there. So the Olmec are the oldest. These colossal heads have absolutely no uh, prior uh, evolutionary roots. There are no tentative moving. Move, there's no tentative move towards making and carving and, and moving colossal heads. Uh, by at least 12, 13, 1400 BC, these people knew how to do this, and they suddenly appear. They do these things, and we don't know anything about it. The uh, I, we find the excuse me the first um, the first iconography appears at this point uh, the first uh, really recognizable gods and Carl Tauba who's sitting here in the front row uh, teaches at the uh, University of California Riverside uh, is the premier person in the uh, study of the origin of the uh, Maya gods going back into the Olmec gods this is uh, the uh, young maize god, the corn god, in a rather infantile form, a favorite theme of the Olmec, found at San Lorenzo. In fact, uh, by our uh, expedition uh, back in the 1960s. Uh, there, there, I can't go into this tonight, but it's an amazing civilization, truly. Now, there are opponents, uh, people who work in other parts of Mesoamerica, who say, oh, this is just a sister civilization. It's just like any, anybody else's. It's like saying that ancient Rome is just a, a sister civilization. Uh, the Huns or, you know, the people up in England or in Norway were just as good as the Romans. Well, <laughs> that ain't true. Uh, the same thing uh, uh, can be said about the, the, the Olmec. Uh, these people really created civilization as we know it. Uh, after the, the, the destruction of San Lorenzo, according to the radiocarbon dates, uh, about uh, 900 B.C., uh, and it was thoroughly destroyed, the monuments were broken up, uh, buried, cast off. Uh, La Venta, which is to the northeast of San Lorenzo in the state of Tabasco, becomes the great site. And you can see a very large pyramid was built here at La Venta, uh, here, of uh, earth and clay. It's never really been excavated. It's, over, it's about 100 feet high. Nobody's ever been inside it to see whether there might be a mighty tomb. And I will predict here, you hear me now, uh, that there's going to be a great tomb in there if somebody knew how to tunnel into this. At any rate, uh, during the La Venta period is when the great uh, time of jade carving in uh, early Mesoamerica takes place. The, the Olmec, as you can see uh, uh, here in this wonderful mask at Dumbarton Oaks, were carvers of jade extraordinary. Uh, and jade carving, be, this becomes the valuable for all of Mesoamerica from this time on. Not gold and all these things that appear late, but jade uh, incorporated uh, in their uh, uh, tombs, uh, worn in ceremonies. This is a life-size mask of carved jade. Uh, really a magnificent thing of the maize god, as Carl has shown. 
who is the probable principal divinity of the Olmec. Well, this brings us in, that, the, that's in the early and middle pre-classic period, up till about 400 B.C. Then we enter into a period in which most of the really interesting discoveries in the Maya area, as far as I'm concerned, are being made right now. Um, wonderful uh, uh, discoveries have been made uh, at a number of sites, especially uh, here in the... Uh, Peyten region of northern Guatemala and uh, neighboring Mexico over the Mexican border. Um, and, and these are the principal sites. This is a late pre-classic site in the Maya area, excuse me, Olmec area, the site of Isapa, El Baul, Caminal Huyu, uh, El Mirador, which I'm going to show you, San Bartolo, which I'm going to show you. There is an amazing stuff being uh, found there uh, every, in every uh, field expedition that's been made. The great site, I'll show you where it is again here, just to remind you. El Mirador is north of Tikal. Tikal is right about here. Uh, El Mirador is almost in Guatemala. And in fact, you can see a great site called Calakmul over the border. If you get on the highest pyramid in El Mirador and vice versa, you can look back. This is an amazing area. I was lucky enough to be taken up there, courtesy of Richard Hansen. I told him I'd, I'd go to El Mirador, but I'll be damned if I'm going to walk there. Two days over a bad trail in and two days over a bad trail back on foot with very little water and food. You have to lug everything with you. I said, I'm not going to do it. You give me a helicopter and I'll go. <laughs> By God, he did. And I went. And it's amazing. This is a, uh, a, a map. The whole site has been mapped by by Dr. Hansen, by Richard Hansen, using the latest equipment. But it is the largest site, largest ancient city in all of the Maya area that ever existed, and it's extraordinarily early. Uh, it reaches its height earlier than uh, Tikal and Huachatun and Copan and Palenque and all of these much better known classic Maya sites. Uh, it's extremely early and extremely large. The two, uh, this is this map, uh, National Geographic map, will show you the main uh, parts of it. This is this is the uh, 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 one of the largest pyramids here, the Tigre complex. There are causeways linking it. Uh, there's a big causeway, not really shown well here, that links it to the Danta pyramid, which is the largest pyramid in Mesoamerica. It's the largest pyramid and tallest pyramid in the New World, and it's probably, in terms of bulk, the largest pyramid in the world, larger than the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt. Um, it's an amazing sight, uh, absolutely tremendous, and it would take a 100 years to really excavate uh, uh, properly. Uh, this is from a helicopter looking at the Danta Pyramid, and you have to realize that the canopy, the top of those trees of that that jungle is about 150 feet high. So you can get an idea of how big the Danta Pyramid is. It goes all the way down below uh, the, the tree level. I've climbed to the top. It's really quite, there's really nothing quite like it. Gigantic causeways in this area. All, everything is built of limestone, doing it the hard way. That is, instead of placing the limestone blocks that they cut out this way as they've made the, the pyramid going up, they placed them facing into the pyramid. So they had to use at least two or three times the normal number of blocks to go in there. But it gives these pyramids great stability. This is really an extraordinary sight. Uh, here's a reconstruction uh, done by a very, uh, uh, Mr. Rutledge, an extremely uh, able artist who's worked for the National Geographic on this particular thing, of what El Mirador might have looked like at its height in the late pre-classic, prior to, let's say, 100 A.D., probably around 200 B.C., with the uh, uh, Tigre Pyramid uh, here, uh, and in the distance, that's the Danta one that you saw. This is a reconstruction of what it looked like. Everything covered with red uh, hematite, um, these enormous pyramids, often crowned with um, three temples on the top, we don't know who they're dedicated to with roofs that were made of perishable materials. They hadn't really uh, put the famous Corbel Arch into view right then and there. 
And we know that this is late pre-classic. There are a number of sites in that area that are that old. Uh, this is what we call the Mirador Basin in northern and kind of northwestern Guatemala, a big area. And if you stand on the Danta Pyramid or Tigre, this one, you can see popping up on the horizon the tops of pyramids of other cities that are almost as big. It's like uh, uh, being on the uh, Triborough Bridge in New York and looking towards Manhattan. I mean, it gives you, you're really looking at something that's worth seeing. It's amazing. And most of those other sites have hardly been touched by archaeologists. It's just so enormous. What do you do with a place like this? Uh, in these early, uh, these late pre-classic uh, pyramids, there's a tremendous amount of iconography. Very few carstone monuments have been found at El Mirador, unlike other uh, late pre-classic sites, particularly on the Pacific coast of Guatemala. Uh, but what you do find up there are these pyramids uh, uh, or platforms with gigantic stucco masks of their gods flanking these inset stairways. And these gods generally show a gigantic bird. Um, excuse me. Um, this particular guy here is really a bird, a sort of anthropomorphic bird. That's his great beak that uh, sticks out. Um, he's either an eagle or a macaw or a vulture. There are various interpretations of this. These are his ear spools here, his eyes here, and but he's got gigantic claws coming out from each side. Uh, this is probably an individual we now know of as a principal bird deity, and he was the principal god of the peoples of the late pre-classic in the Maya area. And I'll come. To, they're really working hard on this now. If you come to that symposium on. Uh, Saturday, you will hear David Stewart talking on the PVD, or the Principal Bird Deity. But all of these, uh, uh, most of these sites of the late pre-classic, uh, going up uh, into Yucatan, into this area here, in the Peyton and elsewhere, in the, in the lowlands, have these gigantic stucco masks. And um, th that's the iconography on which they've been working uh, these days. Let me just go back and show you where this is. Now, the, almost the most exciting site, although it's not as big as El Mirador here, is San Bartolo uh, in the northeastern Peyton, right near the Belize border uh, here. Nothing was known about this site ten years ago until um, a young archaeologist named Bill Saturno, uh, who had been sent up to uh, into this wild region up here <laughs> to look for sites with car stone monuments, and he never found them, stumbled into San Bartolo by sheer chance. And uh, a tunnel had been made. There's Bill there. A tunnel had been made uh, uh, into a back of a pyramid uh, here by looters. And he went in to get out of the famous story, went out to get out of the sun. It was midday. He'd run out of water. He was hot. He was about to get sunstroke and whatnot. And while he was in that tunnel... He looked up, and by God, there was a mural looking out at on the bottom of a mural that the looters hadn't touched. So he called in the National Geographic, got more money, and has been working there ever since with a really good team that, again, includes Carl sitting up in the front row, who's doing the iconography of this site. And they're extraordinary. There was, uh, in late pre-classic times, on the back of a uh, rather modestly sized pyramid, put a room with a flat roof, and it had murals running around four, the four walls up above the level of the entrance doorway. And they have, it turned out that the murals on two of the walls were uh, in situ and in perfect condition, uh, or relatively perfect. And the other two had been destroyed when they had filled in and torn down the whole uh, top of the building to make another pyramid over the whole thing in late pre-classic time. So they've got a double puzzle. They've got the... This is from one of the intact walls, which shows a young uh, uh, god who's got that black spot on his cheek who's perforating his penis right here with an enormous stick, which was a form of auto-sacrifice practiced by Maya lords. But he's a god. And which god is he? He's almost certainly one of the uh, gods known in later times as the hero twins uh, in Maya legend. Uh, this is uh, Bill there. Here is Heather Hurst, who has been drawing the entire 
a mural uh, set, including the, the fragments that are being put together that were laying on the floor um, at half scale. And she's, uh, uh, she's a MacArthur Award recipient. She's really the best archaeolog archaeological artist, I think, in the world. Uh, uh, there's here uh, her reconstruction of uh, part of the north wall, which shows uh, what Carl has identified here as a young maize god with an old neck face uh, and his resurrection from the underworld being greeted by uh, these young women and a young men over here bringing him food and water. And they are going to dress him again as a maize god. He died and went into the underworld in the great Maya legend that's recorded as a Popol Vuh, the Book of Council of the Quiche Maya. And uh, his, he was slain, his head hung in a tree, magically impregnated uh, a young lady, a daughter of a lord in the underworld, and uh, she gave birth to the hero twins in the upper world. She was expelled from the underworld to the upper world, was pregnant, gave birth to the twins, and then they come into the underworld again, and after a series of magic encounters with the lords of the underworld, they uh, manage to get their father, the maze god, out and resurrect him. And this is a favorite theme in Maya iconography from this time on, and especially in the late pre-classic, and especially here at San Bartolo. It's an amazing series, and I can't really go into the whole iconography here, but it's extraordinary. If you take that Olmec mask from Laventa that's at uh, Dumbarton Oaks and get it at the same scale as, as the uh, San Bartolo figure, you can see that he's actually shown as, a May, as an Olmec maze god. They knew who the Olmec were in the late pre-classic. They were always harking back to this Olmec precedent. The way we hark back to the Greeks and the Romans, they were doing the same thing with the Olmec. I don't think they ever forgot them all the way through the post-classic. I won't go into that, but that's the scheme in the Popo Vu of the gods, uh, the old uh, uh, mother and uh, grandmother and uh, grandfather gods, the creator gods, who produce the maize god uh, who uh, impregnates Lady Blood in the underworld. His head spits into her hand, and uh, she then goes up to the upper world and produces the hero twins. And what we're looking at here in the San Bartolo murals is a whole series of hunapus in various ritual activities, including penis perforation, uh, and often in conjunction with the principal bird deity, who is the spiritual counterpart of the grandfather god, the, the creator god himself, known as Itzamna to the later Maya. Rather complex, this, but we're getting a handle on it now. This is uh, uh, the, the, the west wall, a partial thing. This is now being put together in which there's a whole series of world trees with the principal bird deity up here uh, with uh, various offerings being made by the various Hunapu gods uh, down here. And there are also here the first evidence for coronations of a Maya king uh, down here and glyphs to go with it. He is being given a special headdress that he's going to put on. He's seated on top of a kind of a platform, a scaffold uh, reached by a, a ladder, something we find in classic Maya. And here is a row of uh, uh, glyphs here, most of which we still don't understand. They're so early. There's even earlier glyphs at uh, 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 San Bartolo uh, here that go all the way back to at least 300 B.C. Uh, uh, and uh, earlier levels underneath the the building with the murals. And again, except for this glyph here, which is probably an early form of the glyph Achau for king, we really cannot read these. They're too darned early. That, there's not enough of this to do anything with it. The origins of Maya writing are still a puzzle. And we just don't know. But Maya writing is probably as old as any other writing anywhere else in Mesoamerica. And uh, there's a lot of new evidence coming out right now about this. Um, we do have Maya writing on uh, objects in various uh, collections. This happens to be at Dumbarton Oaks. It's Olmec on one side, and the other side was recarved with a figure in late pre-classic times of a seated ruler, and uh, it actually uh, describes uh, his seating here. It shows the, 
the, the, the rear end of somebody sitting down here, and this is his name here, which is repeated over here behind here. This is, again, another early, late pre-classic coronation scene. Now for the classic Maya when we get into there. How can I do this in one hour? I'm going to do my best. There's so much to tell you about this. This, of course, is from the famous Bonham Park murals, which uh, you'll hear about probably to, on Saturday from uh, Mary Miller. She's giving a kind of plenary address to everybody uh, about of all of this. She's been in charge of the Bonham Park um, mural project. That's, of course, dating from about 800 A.D., just about there, these murals, much, 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 much later than what we've been looking at. Um, there, of course, uh, the classic Maya are much, much better known than uh, uh, any other peoples probably of the entire New World because we can read their writing now. Uh, they say 85% of all Maya glyphs have been translated. That's hard to come to that. But we know when uh, uh, the standard average Maya inscription can be read pretty much in its entirety. There are no more uh, puzzles here. It's a wonderful story that's been told many times and I hope that on uh, I think it's on Friday we're going to have that two hour film of how uh, Maya writing was finally deciphered but um, so we can we know a lot about that we know less about the classic in the, the highlands because there are almost no inscriptions whatsoever from the classic Maya period all of the inscriptions basically come from this region uh, uh, here and there are, there are basically thousands of them. And even in long texts on Maya pottery, which tell us a lot of things. Of course, Tikal has been, uh, uh, it's one of the, it's still being excavated. Uh, it's not over now. And they're really concentrating here because the, the classic period is so well known at Tikal. They're concentrating the Guatemalan archaeologists on the late pre-classic part of uh, this whole thing. Uh, big structures with these big stucco masks uh, uh, right now. It's apparent that the, most of these big pyramids are also contained tombs. The looters have known this all along. They go right for them. When they're looting a Maya site, they hit the pyramids right away and go for the royal inscription. So the huge amounts of looting has come there. Uh, for instance, the famous tomb of the guy... Uh, has, uh, this uh, fellow in here, Hasao Chan Kawil, who's buried at... Uh, uh, base level here. Uh, uh, a late, the, the most important late classic king of Tikal, who was engaged in a huge war with the king, his bitter enemy, the king of Kalakmul, to the north over in what's now Mexico. Uh, that's his uh, uh, tomb. Uh, contains a, a wealth of spondylus shells. What we don't get in these tombs is, of course, all the organic materials that were put into there. If we only had proper preservation, but you don't. If we had preservation like they have on the coast of Peru, you would find all the textiles, you'd find bark paper, books folded up in there, you'd find carved wood, you'd find gourds, you'd find basketry. Uh, what we do know, however, from the latest analysis is that cylindrical vessels like this contain chocolate. Every cylindrical vessel that was put in a tomb probably had the chocolate drink in this. This is the latest stuff. I, can't, I, I thought I shouldn't have talked about chocolate tonight, but uh, chocolate was enormously important to, to these people. It was the elite drink that was taken to seal all important uh, diplomatic and marital contracts and everything else that, that went on. And it was the glue that really held uh, Maya society together. Even though they all had these independent kingdoms, chocolate was what toasting and chocolate, night banquets and so forth, was the important thing. Uh, this is uh, some of the bone scenes that we uh, found in a bunch of bones, car incised bones that were found with this great king. And here we find the maize god in his canoe uh, probably uh, being taken to the underworld. And then he's going to come out of the underworld uh, in his canoe. And these are Chak's rain gods fishing. Uh, and then a captive. And I'll come to this in a moment. Thanks to um, uh, glyphic work uh, done over a period of years going way back in the 20th century to the work, let's say, of uh, Heinrich Berlin uh, on the uh, inscriptions, we know that uh, uh, each important Maya polity or political uh, uh, unity, each important Maya city had its own emblem glyph. And uh, 
Here are some important ones. There's many more that have been identified uh, uh, since then. And once that was identified, you could start, and we, once we knew from Tatyana Proskoryakov's work that this is history being recorded on the monuments, then you could start talking about Maya politics and the relationship between sites. It's now enormously complex. Uh, the, the Maya area was never an empire, as Sylvanus Morley had thought. He called it the old empire and the new empire. Those never exist existed. What you had, you had cities of various powers and or lack of powers, uh, some of which lorded it over others, some of which beat others at warfare, some of which managed to uh, establish diplomatic relations through wife exchange and things of this sort. Uh, rather complex uh, things that of people like Simon Martin and Nikolai Gruba who made this particular diagram are here. Uh, Tikal, for instance, had very bad relationships with Kalakmul, constant warfare. One would triumph and then the other two would triumph back and forth. And they extended their tentacles around to other one of these politics. What it looks like a lot now, from the point of view of politics, what was going on in central and northern Italy during the Renaissance. Uh, same culture, same civilization, but different politics. Uh, but this we are now getting a big handle on. Warfare, uh, unlike what Eric Thompson had thought when he wrote his general works on the Maya, warfare was constant in the Maya area. And uh, it went on from the very first, from the late pre-classic even earlier, all the way up through the uh, Spanish conquest. They were constantly at war with each other. They were not a peaceful people, as Morley and Eric Thompson had thought. Uh, this is a bound captive from uh, Tony Na, which is a, a wonderful site, uh, really getting up into the highlands above Palenque. That's got lots of wonderful sculpture, almost three-dimensional, in the, uh, a great museum at the site. That's well worth a visit if you haven't been to Tony Na. If you go to Palenque, make sure you drive up to Tony Na. And he's identified who he is uh, by his glyphs, uh, uh, who he was and where they got him from, what particular warfare. Tony Na was a very warlike place. So they were constantly at war with each other. Um, a lot of the work uh, in more recent years that's uh, still being written up right now uh, on classic Maya sites has gone on at Copan in the east and Palenque in the west. These are on the periphery of the Maya area, but in many respects they're enormously important. Copan over here, and Palenque uh, here in the west, on the peripheries of the Maya area. A lot less stodgy than Tikal in, its art, in their art. Uh, Copan specializing in three-dimensional uh, lime or trachyte sculpture, and uh, uh, Palenque in beautiful stucco work and very delicately carved uh, reliefs. And they are really wonderful. Copan is very exciting because it was a Copan where uh, Mayanists uh, were able to demonstrate that the inscriptions which had been castigated by Joyce Marcus, among others, as just being propaganda and made-up history, were real history. That the people mentioned on them actually existed and uh, existed when the Maya said they did. This is the dynastic record of 16 successive kings. Alter Q here and here uh, at Copan. Uh, these people seated on their own name glyphs here, uh, going around here from the earliest uh, 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 here to the latest uh, earliest uh, uh, here to the latest here. He's the first king of Copan, Yashkokmo, according to the inscriptions, and the latest one who commissioned this one, uh, Yashpasa. Uh, were these real kings? And it so happens that by tunneling in from the cut river bank on the side uh, here of the Copan River, putting tunnels into various levels in this great uh, which, uh, area, which is where the state temple of Copan was, uh, they have found the whole dynastic succession in there, king after king. Not all there, but the really important ones, including the first one. Right at base level, uh, this is Bob Shearer from the University of Pennsylvania excavating uh, what uh, turned out to be the first king of uh, all and his another one nearby of his, almost certainly his wife. In other words, Yashkuk Mo, 
who was importing, who had come in from the West. Now that I'm not going to go into any great detail. They're still being argued about uh, here. Tikal and other important myocytes like Copan, there are early dynastic records that show uh, new kings coming in from the West, from some other place. And the other place has to be Teotihuacan in the Valley of Mexico. When you're taken out outside of Mexico City, the Pyramides, you're, you're, you're taken out to Teotihuacan, which, or Teotihuacan, uh, which is the largest city, uh, ever, uh, in the New World. And that were, uh, certainly in terms of population, a great city of the early classic. Probably from about 150 AD, maybe a little earlier, uh, on up till 600 AD when it was destroyed. And so you find in these early tombs imported pottery from from that uh, area. Uh, that uh, particular one, uh, stuccoed, is a pure Teotihuacan uh, tripod vase, with, which we know held chocolate in it because it's been analyzed as having chocolate. There are two uh, alkaloids in chocolate. The, uh, caffeine, which you all know about, that's the kick in coffee, and theobromine, which is peculiar to chocolate. You find those two together when they scrape the bottoms of these vessels, uh, QED, it's chocolate. And probably every vessel that looks like this once had chocolate uh, in it. So the Teotihuacan influence on is now being worked on. Lots we don't know about it. As far as I'm concerned, there was a Teotihuacan empire. There's plenty of evidence for this. All kinds of explanations come from the Mayanists. They can always find some kind of excuse. You can't get a PhD unless you're going to argue with somebody. And... Uh, Basically, they're to- barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> There's every evidence that this was a mighty empire and that they controlled both the Maya highlands and Maya lowlands, in fact, most of Mesoamerica, at least for a 100 years, probably longer. Uh, and then it becomes more Maya as this thing wanes. But they never forgot about Teotihuacan. This was always a great city that they, that they remembered, at least the kings did. Now the classic Maya collapse. You can talk about this till the cows come home. Or people used to gas on this subject. To, I mean, on and on and on with all kinds of weird theories like destroyed by earthquakes, by this, by that. Uh, no civilization ever gets wiped out from one cause. It's just like a, a, a natural species, like, like the Atlantic salmon. I like to fish for Atlantic salmon. They're in trouble everywhere, all over the North Atlantic. They may go extinct as in the wild form. Everything is impinging upon the Atlantic salmon now, overfishing, netting by native peoples at the mouths of the rivers, uh, fish farming is doing horrible stuff, global warming, you name it. It's all coming together. They can't recover. And that's what happened to the classic Maya. That's a story, as you can see. Uh, this is an old one from one of Morley's early books, a wonderful book, The Ancient Maya. And it shows uh, the, uh, uh, the number of monuments that were produced by 20-year periods. Uh, approximately 20 year periods all through Maya uh, 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 history. This is the dates uh, 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 AD. And uh, you can see it starts taking off. This is where the Teotihuacan influence is in here. And it comes up here and reaches a peak about 700 or so. And then in the 8th century, boom, it starts going like that until finally by 909, that's the end. That's the last classic Maya monument with a date on it. Uh, so there was a collapse. There's no question about it. A place like Tikal may have looked like this at the end, a hundred years after uh, its basic abandonment. Uh, uh, t- tomorrow I'm being taken down to see those wonderful Carlos Yera murals are down in San Diego. I've never seen them. But uh, this is actually based on uh, this one uh, of Tikal and its decline. But uh, people were camping out there still, but it's gone. Um, uh, it was a huge cataclysm that happened to people. Destruction everywhere. The monuments have been destroyed. Eyes gouged out of monuments. They've been smashed up. Mouths chipped away. Something big had happened. And the area was, most of the central Maya area was abandoned. Not the northern Maya area, but the central one. So what are the causal factors? I'm put them up here. Uh, you can read them. And all of those things we know took place. Every single one of them. Uh, There's good evidence for every one of those things. Uh, Most of the work has gone on uh, uh, on uh, the the warfare, environmental destruction, and drought. 
the uh, environmental destruction is uh, 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 clear from cores that have been made in, in uh, lakes in the Peyton in northern Guatemala, etc. cetera, uh, sedimentation taking place. They had cut down all the forest, basically. There was nothing left, uh, probably just decorative trees by this time. I mean, it was stripped, and Mexico is stripping uh, the, the area right now, just like that, and Guatemala started. Uh, this is Guatemala, the Guatemalan border here. This is Mexico in here. This is the great jungle that once covered that area that only exists in places like El Mirador now in northern Guatemala. And the Maya had done did this themselves back um, in the late classic from about uh, 600 on. Uh, there was nothing left. And we know that they had overextended themselves. It's a perfect case of environmental destruction leading to uh, bad things. Tremendous amounts of warfare was going on. This is a Maya vase that's been unrolled uh, so that you can see what's going on here. Uh, here are these uh, Mayas, many, many scenes like this on late classic pottery. This is a cylindrical vase that's been unrolled by uh, uh, Justin Kerr um, uh, with his Hasselblad camera that's been especially devised with it. Wonderful record that Justin has given us of Maya life, Maya hieroglyphs and everything by unrolling all of these vases in public and private collections. And uh, this is from the late classic and it shows stripped captives. Uh, this guy here is being naked was uh, considered terrible among the Maya, so they've been stripped and they're going to be taken off where they're going to be tortured, obviously, and, by warriors and uh, then, then finally dispatched. You didn't want to fall into the hands of the Maya. In fact, uh, I'd much rather be a captive of the Aztecs any day than of the Maya, but uh, the Aztecs uh, didn't torture people as far as we know. We know the Maya did. There's excellent evidence for the effect on this on classic Maya sites. Uh, this is something for that um, Arthur Demarest, uh, one of his publications, who was in charge of the excavations at Dos Pilas in Guatemala. And uh, originally, uh, this part of the site of Dos Pilas looked like this until the stepped up warfare. You know, this is before AD 761. After AD 76. 61, there was tremendous warfare going on, really stepped up. And they started to put defensive palisades and everything around these buildings, abandoning others and uh, moving in the, the, the settlements inside there. It's like, uh, you know, putting the, 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 the wagons in a circle to keep the redskins off um, in Wild West movies. Exactly the same thing was going on here at those fields. And there's wonderful evidence for this. There's a nearby site called Aguateca, which uh, was totally demolished before they could really get out with all their stuff. So everything has been left in situ and burned buildings and whatnot. Uh, Takeshi Inomata, now the University of Arizona, has done wonderful excavations there. It's a kind of a Pompeii where everything was just left there. Uh, so you can really see what these buildings were being used for. Um, that's ongoing research, too. Um, there, there's Aguateca uh, up there, and it's, it's really been... Uh, here it is here. Um, it's been... Uh, was totally demolished, burned to the ground, and everything. There's uh, the site of Yaschilan along the Usamacinta River. There's a structure there that is covered with uh, arrowheads or dart points, absolutely covered. The Japanese have dug that, and, you know, I mean, there's... Hundreds of thousands of arrowheads rain, had rained down on this place at this point. So there was warfare, I can assure you. So that was a very important thing. And then maybe revolution. I mean, uh, Thompson was the first one to come up with this idea. Here's a, a real Tory, if there ever was one, talking about revolution. But it, it almost certainly did happen. Because you find, for instance, on the Bonaparte murals here, which are about the time... The, uh, the collapse is really getting going. Uh, the eyes of almost all of the kings of the important figures here have been chipped out very carefully. Sometimes the mouths have been chipped out. On the monuments, too, you find the same thing on the stele. Uh, these guys, uh, really the elite, 
were, I think, disposed of at this time, probably including the scribes who were producing the codices. Whole libraries went up at this time. We've only got four surviving books, and they all date to the post-classic afterwards. We don't have any of the thousands of books we know must have been in use in classic in the classic Maya era. They had whole libraries. If we could just get two or three new ones, all our ideas about the Maya will change. Someday in a dry cave in Belize or someplace like that, somebody's going to find a box with intact codices in it. But uh, I may never live to see that, but it's going to happen. The northern area... Uh, People are trying to argue now why this happened. But the northern area didn't suffer this, uh, at least for a while. Uh, we have what's called the terminal classic. At the very end of the last century or so of the classic, um, it, it, it has a kind of fluorescence, and especially in the northwest among the Pu'uk Hills of Yucatan. Uh, that's where you get the great site of Ushmal, Kaaba, Sa'il, Labna, etc., et, et which uh, are really very, very beautiful sites with lots of inscriptions, usually uh, in the lintels, in a rather different uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, record. Chichen Itza is another one that uh, is flourishing in the terminal classic. Uh, uh, in a site, we call this style the Pu'uk, some of the best architecture ever produced that had a heavy influence on, let's say, Frank Lloyd Wright, was found at uh, Ushmal. He was heavily influenced by these buildings around here in some of his uh, architecture. He was wild about this kind of Maya architecture. He would not have been so wild about the architecture of the Peten, that's for sure. So then we enter into the post-classic Maya. Uh, and here the big argument is, and I will say it is an argument, Carl and I are on one side, and all the properly thinking people who worked at Tula, for instance, uh, in central Mexico, think uh, identically with it, that there were real Toltecs, uh, a people who had uh, arisen in central Mexico after the ruin of Teotihuacan uh, in the valley of Mexico, and they flourished. Uh, they built a capital city called Tolan, or Tula as it's called today, uh, here north of Mexico City. Mexico City is about here. That's the valley of Mexico. There is about where Teotihuacan is. Remember, they came all the way down and took the Maya area over. Now, in the post-classic, uh, beginning probably around more or less 900, there are now ethno-historic accounts about the Toltecs, who the Aztecs considered their predecessors, the people who had given them civilization. Uh, there are people who deny, many Mayanists deny the Toltecs ever lived. Oh, no, they're just... They're basically Mayas who wandered up there. Um, as Carl likes to say, uh, well, the Aztecs thought they existed. Why shouldn't we? And he's right. I, I've never changed my mind about the Toltecs. I think there was a period in the Maya area at Chichen Itza where the Toltecs really did invade and really took over northern Yucatan and probably also uh, took over part of the uh, Guatemala Chiapas Highlands down here. But Chichen especially. And there's a Toltec period there, uh, as far as I'm concerned. This battle is still going on. And uh, you'll, uh, I've never changed my mind about Tula and the position of the Toltecs. Uh, there's a Toltec art style that emphasizes these tough-looking warriors with pillbox-shaped uh, hats, the famous Atlantean warriors uh, here, and uh, uh, built a pyramid like this, Pyramid B at... Uh, uh, Tula with these great uh, standing warrior figures on top with a flat roof building and then these colonnades which is typical of Toltec architecture which is not to be found before the Toltecs came along. And according to the ethno-historic records from both central Mexico and from the Maya area uh, the Toltecs seem to have gone to the coast of Veracruz and uh, according to the Maya sources uh, a guy called Kukul Khan, the feathered serpent, probably a Toltec king, took his people across into Yucatan, invaded and conquered them, and established a new capital again at the old capital of Chichen Itza. This, of course, is the famous Castillo, which was dug back in the 1930s by the Mexicans, 
and you're looking from the Temple of the Warriors, which Carnegie had uh, dug and excavated also at the same time in the 1920s and 30s. You're looking at a chalk mool here, I think a sacrificial figure here that uh, probably contained heart offerings and whatnot, looking out. Now, there are people who say this is just developed from the captive figures of the Maya. I don't think so. It's typical of northwestern Mexico, in particular Michoacan, Guerrero, and so forth, and you find them at Tula. Uh, I think they're typically Toltec. I think the whole thing is Toltec, even including this four-sided pyramid. There's another pyramid, as you know, inside there, where you find the famous uh, uh, red jaguar thrown in there with jade inlaid eyes. I'm not going to get into the Chichen uh, bit here, but I really do think that there was a Toltec Chichen. Unfortunately, Carnegie was there for, God, 17 years excavating, and we know less about Chichen Itza than other, any other site of any note in Mesoamerica, in spite of the fact that maybe a million tourists see it every year. We don't know nothing about it, really. It's chronology. Uh, basically, it's, to me, it's still a big mystery. Uh, Unfortunately, well, this is from the Carnegie excavations in the Temple of the Warriors, the great murals here. And I'm pretty sure you're looking here at the Toltecs invading by uh, water along the coast, probably the Campeche coast, of a Maya uh, uh, area, Maya town. And you can see the typical Maya houses here. Uh, this dates, God knows to what, probably about uh, 1000 A.D., would be good. There, incidentally, there's one of these murals that shows um, blonde, blue-eyed captives with uh, basically white skin being sacrificed by Toltec warriors. <laughs> when I was a kid, I read. I was a great devotee of uh, uh, Prince Valiant, and I remember well one episode in Prince Valiant where he comes down to Yucatan <laughs> with his fellow Vikings uh, and invades and. One can laugh, but 1,000 A.D. is a good time to have Vikings come down. Nobody's really explained those blonde, blue-eyed people. Thompson said, oh, they're devotees of the sun god, you know, with their yellow hair. Well, I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, uh, more murals have been discovered at other sites, particularly Mayapan, which took over after Chichen Itza fell. There are a lot of ethno-historic accounts about that, um, uh, downfall of Chichen Itza. Maya Pan is a kind of a 15th century rather grungy ruin. They've reconstructed the main pyramid, which we know from Spanish sources was dedicated to Kukulkan, the feathered serpent. And many, many uh, um, effigy incense burners have been found in conjunction with the elite buildings in this little site that is surrounded by a great big wall. It's a walled site where everybody had to live inside uh, Maya Pond. Uh, compared to what, if you're used to classic Maya sites, it isn't much, but they found wonderful murals here quite recently that have not really been fully published as far as I know. Um, so this, this is an ongoing site. Tulum was seen by the Spaniards in use. They went along the coast, came over from Cozumel, and Tulum was still occupied. Other sites along here, they saw people running around. They called it the Gran Cairo. They thought it was as big as Cairo. Well, forget it. It's small. Cairo in those days was enormous, bigger than any, any city in, in Europe by a long shot. Um, and, uh, but it's a wonderful site. It was loved to death in the last sort of four or five decades. When I first went to this place in 1948, uh, there was uh, the guardian here, a Maya Indian. This was independent Maya back in 1948, the Talking Cross Maya. Uh, <laughs> really, they owned the place. And uh, they, the guardian had a, a book that showed how many people had come in that year. Five other people had been in 1948 to this site. Now... What is it, 50,000 a day come in from the cruise ships and God knows what? They've roped off a lot of it. It's a beautiful place and very, very late. Occupied right up and through the, con through the period of the Spanish conquest, I think. And wonderful murals inside all of them, all of these uh, rooms. Plenty of iconography. There, incidentally, if you want to go dipping here, biggest sharks I've ever seen were going along here. <laughs> So the Spanish conquest, <laughs> got to end somewhere. Uh, 
the, the Spanish conquest. It took a long time to conquer the Maya. And we have just loads and loads, of course, documents now because of that. Uh, the Montejos, uh, uh, the whole family, there were uncles and sons and God knows what. The Montejos were the principal conquistadores. But it took them a long time because the Maya... Uh, never had an empire like the Aztecs did. You couldn't go to the central part of the empire the way the Az- Cortes did, right to the heart, and grab Motacasoma, the emperor. There was nobody to grab here because there were all these little independent uh, uh, principalities at, at this point, and forever. This is the way the Maya were. So they get they take over one, but the others were still in revolt. And uh, the, the Maya, unlike the Aztec, would do things like fighting at night. They fought guerrilla actions. Uh, fought completely different than the Aztecs. They didn't like pitched battles. Um, they kind of reminds one of Vietnam, I have to admit. They were, they fought like that. And I can tell you it's hard. It took decades to, to finally conquer the Maya. It wasn't until the 1690s that they conquered the last Maya kingdom in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, Tayasal, that's now in, underneath Flores in northern Guatemala, uh, where they were still had in the late 17th century, still using hieroglyphic books. So what did the Spaniards do? Isn't Photoshop fun? I didn't really burn a codex. Uh, what the Spaniards did uh, was burn the knowledge of the Maya of their own past. Uh, they burned hundreds, perhaps thousands of codices. We don't know how many. Because anybody who, who wrote or could read this stuff was under suspicion of I- idolatry. And I'm not going to go into that. If you've seen that film, that film is now available, uh, Breaking the Maya Code, two-hour film. It's now out. You can get it. If you anybody interested, I'll tell you where to write in. It's a wonderful film. Tells you the whole story. And the guy who was responsible for the, some of the worst destruction was a guy from whom also, ironically, we get a lot of our knowledge about the Maya. And that's Bishop Diego de Landa, the first Franciscan bishop of Yucatan, who wrote the, uh, uh, the account of the things of Yucatan, Relación de las Cosas de Yucatan, in which he tells you how they wrote. And here, I'm not going to get into this. This was, in fact, the... Uh, equivalent of the Rosetta Stone. It's basically a biscript. You need a biscript, really, to crack a, uh, an ancient script, which is what Champollion had with the Rosetta Stone. This is a biscript in Spanish and in uh, Maya here, the Maya hieroglyphs. And every one of those 27 hieroglyphs there has proved to be accurate. And the, uh, the, the decipherment was the basic decipherment of the of the linguistic part of this, a real decipherment is when you can actually pronounce what you're reading in the language in which it was written. And we only were able to do this thanks to this Russian scholar, Yuri Knorozov. I gave a big talk on him uh, uh, last week in Washington. Really an amazing guy. And he used the Lunda alphabet to great avail uh, here. But the, you must remember that the Spanish conquest, everybody said, well, what happened to the Maya? They're all gone now. I said, well, there's six or eight million of them still around who haven't been told that they're all gone. The Maya continue, still live. They've had terrible recent history, and not only in Guatemala, but elsewhere. Um, as the dominant culture, Hispanic culture, has overwhelmed them, whether in the form of military or massacres or uh, uh, economic oppression, God knows what. But uh, there's still plenty of them around, and they're getting to know about their past, uh, reintroduced to their past. This is a, the great Solala uh, market, uh, Solala uh, um, near Lake Atitlan in uh, Guatemala, this beautiful, beautiful lake. And many of these people still continue their old ritual activities. This is a shaman at the site of uh, Utatlan in a tunnel that's underneath the uh, main uh, temple there praying with incense, Maya incense, palm, uh, for a family that's come there to pray with him. There's lots of this going on. A great deal of Maya culture still goes on underneath a facade of Latin American Catholicism. It's, 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 it's there. And it's through them that many of the insights into Maya thought and iconography and all sorts of things has come about. So 
uh, this kind of research is going on now with the cooperation of the Maya. And I'll stop there. And uh, with beautiful Guatemala, that's Lake Atitlan. Don't forget to go there if you haven't seen it. Thank you. <laughs>